how the beacon fire was extinguished. Soon after this, Nicholas Asherton, attended by two or three men, came up and asked whither the old witch had lawn. Mistress Nutter pointed out the course taken by the fugitives who had run towards the northern extremity of the hill, down the sides of which he had already plunged. She has been carried off by her grandson, Jem Device, said Mistress Nutter. Be quick, or you will lose her. Aye, be quick, be quick, added Mother Chattox. Yonder they went to the back of the beacon, casting a look at the wretched speaker, and finding she was too grievously wounded to be able to move. Nicholas bestowed no further thought upon her, but set off with his companions in the direction pointed out. He speedily arrived at the edge of the hill, and looking down it, sought in vain for any appearance of use. The sides were here steep and shelving, and some hundred yards lower down were broken into the region, behind one of which it was possible the old witch and her grandson might be concealed. So without a moment's hesitation, the squire descended and began to search about in the hollows, scrambling over the loose stone, or sliding down some paces with uncertain body soil. When he fancied he heard a plaintive cry, he looked around but could see no one. The whole side of the mountain was lighted by fire from the beacon, which instead of diminishing burned with increased ardor, so that every object was as easily to be discerned as in the daytime. But notwithstanding this, he could not detect whence the sound proceeded. It was repeated, but more faintly than before, and Nicholas almost persuaded himself it was a voice of hot calling for help. Motioning to his followers, who were engaged in the search like himself, he still the squire listened intently, and again caught the sound, being this time convinced it arose from the ground. Was it possible the unfortunate attorney had been buried alive, or had he been thrust into some hole and a stone place over it, which he found it impossible to remove? The latter idea seemed the more probable, and Nicholas was guided by a feeble repetition of the noise towards a large fragment of rock, which, on examination, had evidently been rolled from the point immediately over the mouth of a hollow. The squire instantly set himself to work to dislodge the ponderous stone, and aided by two of his men who lent their broad shoulders to the task, quickly accomplished his object, disclosing what appeared to be the mouth of a cavernous recess. From out this, as soon as the stone was removed, the head of Master Pops and Nicholas, bidding him be of good cheer, laid hold of him to draw him forth, as he seemed to have some difficulty in extricating himself when the attorney cried out, Do not pull so hard, squire, that accursed gem device has got hold of my legs. Not so hard, sir, I entreat. Bid him let go, said Nicholas, unable to refrain from laughing, or we will unearth him from the badger's hall. He pays no heed to what I say to him, cried Pops. Oh dear, oh dear, he is dragging me down. Again, and as he saw the attorney, notwithstanding all Nicholas's efforts to restrain him, was pulled down into the hall. The squire was at a loss what to do and was considering whether he should resort to the tedious process of digging him out when a scrambling noise was heard and the captive's head once more appeared above the ground. Are you coming out now? asked Nicholas. Alas, no, replied the attorney, unless you will make terms with the rascal. He declares he will strangle me if you do not promise to set him and his grandmother free. His mother then beat with him, asked Nicholas, to be sure. Pots, and we are as badly off our room as three foxes in the hall, and there is no other outlet, said the squire. I conclude do not by the attorney. I groped about like a mole when I was first thrust into the cavern by a gem device, but I could find no means of exit. The entrance was blocked by the red stone, which you had some difficulty in moving, but which gem could shift at will, or he pushed it aside in a moment and brought it back to his place when he returned just now with his old hag. Probably that was affected by a witchcraft. Most likely, said Nicholas, but for your being in it, we would stop this fall and bury the two wretches alive. Get me out of her, so Master Nicholas, I implore of you, and then do what you please, cried Pops. Jem is looking at my legs as if he would pull them off. We will try who is strongest, said Nicholas, again seizing hold of Pops by the shoulders. Oh dear, oh dear, I can't bear it. Let go, shrieked the attorney. I shall be stretched to twice my natural length. My joints are starting from their sockets. My legs are coming off. Oh, oh. Lender and near one of you, cried Nicholas, to the men. We'll have him out, whatever he the consequence, but I warn from your hearts, you have no right to use me thus torture, or oh, all oh, my loins are rushing my back breaking, I am a dead man. The hag has got hold of my right leg, while Jem is sucking with all his force to the left. Pull away, cried Nicholas, he is coming, my legs are off, yell hot as he was flustered more, which you heard through the squire and his assistants on the back. I shall never be able to walk more, nor heaven be praised, he added looking down on his lower limbs. I have only lost my boots, never mind it then, cried Nicholas, but thank your stars you were. Go round once more. 
party jam and continue shouting down the hall. Don't come for her once and bring Mother Dembi with you. We'll close the mouth of this hall in such a way that you shan't require another grave. Do you hear? Yeah, replied Jim, his voice coming hoarsely and hollowly like the essence of a ghost. Am I to go free if I comply? Certainly not, replied the squire. You have a choice between this hall and the hangman's court at Lancaster. That is all. In either case, you will die by suffocation. But be quick, we have wasted time already with you. Then, if that's how you'll do for me, squire, and and stay where I am, rejoined Jem. Very well, replied Nicholas. Here, my man, stop this hall with earth and stones. My spots, you will lend a hand to the task. Readily, sir, replied the attorney. Though I shall lose the pleasure I had anticipated of seeing that old carrion crow roasted alive. Stay a bit, squire, roared Jem, as preparations were actively made for carrying Nicholas's orders into execution. Stay a bit, and Anne, come out and bring towards women with me. I thought you changed your mind, replied Nicholas, laughing. But be upon your guard, he added in a low tone to the others, and seize him the moment he appears. But Jem evidently found it no easy matter to perform his promises, for stifled shrieks and other noises proclaimed that a desperate struggle was going on between him and his grandmother. Aha! exclaimed Nicholas, placing his ear to the hall. The old hag is unwilling to come fall, and sits and scratches like a mountain, while Jem grips her little hand like a terrier. It is a hard hustle between them, but he is getting the better of it, and is pushing her for now look out, and as he spoke, Mother Demdi's terrible head protruded from the ground, and despite the execrations she poured forth upon her enemies, she was instantly seized by them, drawn out of the cavern, and secured. While the men were thus engaged, and while Nicholas's attention was for an instant diverted, Jem bounded forth as suddenly as a wolf from his lair, and dashed aside all opposition, plunged down the hill. He is useless to pursue him, said Nicholas. He will not escape. The whole country will be roused by the beacon fire, and who and cry shall be made after him. Right, exclaimed Hoss, and now let someone creep into the cavern and bring out my boots, and then I shall be in a better condition to attend you. The request being complied with, and the attorney being once more equipped for walking, the party climbed the hillside, and bringing Mother Demby with them, shaped their course towards the beacon. And now to see what had taken place in the interim. Scarcely had the squire quitted Mistress Nutter than Sir Ralph Ashton rode up to her. Why do you like to hear, madam, he said, in a stern tone, somewhat tempted by sorrow. I have held back to give you an opportunity of escape. The hill is invested by your enemies. On that side, Richard Norwell is advancing. On, on this side, Sir Thomas Metcalfe and his followers, you may possibly effect a retreat in the opposite direction, but not a moment must be lost. I will go with you, said Alison. No, no, interposed Richard. You have not strength for the effort and will only retard her. I thank you for your devotion, my child, said Mistress Nutter with a look of grateful tenderness. But it is unneeded. I have no intention of lying. I shall surrender myself into the hands of justice. Do not mistake the matter, Madam Sir, Ralph said, and delude yourself with the notion that either your rank or well will screen you from punishment. Your guilt is too clearly established to allow you a chance of escape, and though I myself am acting wrongfully in counselling flight to you, I am led to do so from the friendship once subsisting between us, and the relationship which unfortunately I cannot destroy. It is you who are mistaken, not I, Sir Ralph, replied Mr. Snutter. I have no thought of turning aside the sword of justice, but shall court its sharpest edge, hoping by a full avowal of my offences in some degree to atone for them. My only regret is that I shall leave my child unprotected, and that my fate will bring dishonour upon her. Oh, think not of me, dear mother, cried Alison, but persist unhesitatingly in the course you have laid down, for rather would I see you act thus far, rather hear the sentiments you have uttered, even though they may be attended by the saddest consequences, then behold you in your former proud position. And impenitent, think not of me then, or rather think only how I rejoice that your eyes are at length open, and that you have cast off bonds of iniquity. I can now pray for you with all hope that my intercession will prevail, and in parting with you in this word shall be sustained by the conviction that we shall meet in eternal happiness hereafter. Mistress Nutter threw her arms about her daughter's neck, and they mingled their tears together. Sir Ralph Ashton was much moved. It is a pity she should fall into their hands, he observed to Richard, and know not how to advise, replied the latter, greatly troubled. Ah, it is too late, exclaimed the knight. Here comes Norwell and Mecca. The poor lady's firmness will be severely tested. The next moment the magistrate and the knight came up with such of their 
their attendants as were not engaged in pursuing the wishes, several of whom had already been captured. On seeing Mistress Nutter, Sir Thomas Metcalf sprang from his horse and would have seized her, but Sir Ralph interposed, saying, She has surrendered herself to me. I will be answerable for her safe custody. Your pardon, Sir Ralph, observed Norwell. The arrest must be formally made by a constable. Sparshot, execute your warrant. Upon this, the official, leaping from his horse, displayed his staff and a piece of parchment to Mistress Nutter, telling her she was his prisoner. The lady bowed her head. Shan I tea her hands, your worship, demanded the constable of the magistrates. On no account, fellow, interposed Sir Ralph. I will have no indignity offered her. I have already said I will be responsible for her. You will recollect she is arrested for witchcraft, Sir Ralph, observed Norwell. She shall answer to the charges brought against her. I pledge myself to that, replied Sir Ralph. And by a full confession, said Mistress Nutter, you may pledge yourself to that also, Sir Ralph. She avows her guilt, cried Norwell. I take you all to witness it. I shall not forget it, said Sir Thomas Metcalf. Nor I, nor I, cried Sparshot, and two or three others of the attendants. This girl is my prisoner, said Sir Thomas Metcalf, dismounting and advancing towards Alison. She is a witch as well as the rest. It is false, cried Richard, and if you attempt to lay hands upon her, I will strike you to the earth. To death, exclaimed Metcalf, throwing his sword. I will not let this insolence pass unpunished. I have other affronts to chastise. Stand aside, or I will cut your throat. Hold, Sir Thomas, cried Sir Roll Asherton, authoritatively. Settle your quarrel hereafter. If you have any to adjust, but I will have no fighting now. Alison is no wish. You are well aware that she was about to be imperiously and cruelly sacrificed by Mother Demdi, and the rescue was the main object of our coming giver. Still, suspicion attaches to her, said Metcalf. Whether she be the daughter of Elizabeth Device or Alice Nutter, she comes of a bad stock, and I protest against her being allowed to go free. However, if you are resolved upon it, I have nothing more to say. I shall find over time and place to adjust my differences with Master Richard Ashton. When you please, sir, replied the young man sternly, and I will answer for the property of the course I have pursued, said Sir Ralph. But here comes Nicholas and Mother Demdi. Demdi taken. I am glad of it, cried Mother. Chatter slightly raising herself as she spoke. Kill her or she will escape you. When Nicholas came up with her old hag, both Sir Ralph Asherton and Roger Norwell put several questions to her, but she refused to answer their interrogations and horrified by her blasphemies and imprecations, they caused her to be removed to a short distance while a consultation was held as to the course to be pursued. We have made half a dozen of these miscreants prisoners, said Roger Norwell, and the whole of them had better be taken to Warley, where they could be safely confined in the old dungeon of the abbey, and after their examination on the morrow, can be removed to Lancaster Castle. Be it so, replied Sir Ralph, but must you, unfortunate lady, he added, pointing to Mistress Nutter, be taken with them? Assuredly, replied Norwell, we can make no distinction among such offenders, or if there are any degrees in guilt, hers of the highest class, you had better take leave of your daughter, said Sir Ralph to Mistress Nutter. I thank you for the hint, replied the lady. Farewell, dear Alison, she added, straining her to her bosom. We we must part for some time once more before I quit this world in which I have played so we a part I will fain look on you, fain bless you if I have the power but this must be at the last when my trials are well nigh over and when all is about to close upon me. Or must it be thus exclaimed Alison in a voice half suffocated with emotion. It must replied her mother. Do not attempt to shake my resolution, my sweet child. Do not weep for me. Amidst all the terrors that surround me, I am happier now than I have been for years. I shall strive to work out my redemption by prayers. And you will succeed, cried Alison. Not so shrewd, Mother MD. The find will have his own. She is bound to him by a compact which no can and no. I shall like to see the instrument, said Potts. I might give a legal opinion upon it. Perhaps it might be avoided, and in any case, its production in court would have an admirable effect. I think I see the council examining it, and hear the judges calling for it. The place before them is in Vermont. Majesty's signature must be a curiosity in its way. Our gracious and sagacious monarch would delight in it. Peace, exclaimed Nicholas, and take care, he cried, that no further interruptions are offered by that infernal high. Have you done, madam? 
added to Mistress Nutter, who still remained with her daughter folded in her arm, and yet replied the lady, Oh, what happiness I have worn away, what anguish, what remorse brought upon myself by the evil life I have led. As I gaze on this fair face and think it mine long, long have brightened my dark and desolate life with its sunshine. As I think upon all this, my fortitude well nigh deserts me, and I have need of support from on high to carry me through my trial. But I have fear it will be denied me, Nicholas Asherton. You have the deed of the gift of Rudley in your possession. Henceforth, Alison is mistress of the mansion and domain. Provided always they are not forfeited to the crown, which I apprehend will be the case, suggested Potts. I will take care she is put in possession of them, said Nicholas. As to you, Richard, continued Mistress Nutter, the time may come when your devotion to my daughter may be rewarded, and I cannot be so a better boon upon you than by giving you her hand. It may be well, I should give my consent now, and if no other obstacle should arise to the union, may she be yours, and happiness, I am sure, will attend you. Overpowered by conflicting emotion, Alison hid her face in her mother's bosom, and Richard, who was almost equally overcome, was about to reply when Mother Demdy broke upon them. They will never be united, she screamed. Never. I have said it, and my words will come true. Thinkest thou a wish like thee can bless a union, Alice Nutter? Thy blessings are curses, thy wishes disappointments, and despair. Thriftless love shall be Alison, and the grave shall be her bride. Bear the witch's daughter shall share the witch's fate. These boarding words produce a terrible effect on the hearers. Heed her not, my sweet child. She speaks falsely, said Mistress Nutter, endeavouring to reassure her daughter. But the tone in which the words were uttered showed that she herself was greatly alarmed. I have cursed them all, and I will curse them again, yelled Mother Demdy. Away with the old screech owl, cried Nicholas. Take her to the beacon, and if she continues troublesome, hurl her into the flame. Notwithstanding the hag's struggles and imprecations, she was removed. Whatever may tide, Alison, cried Richard, my life shall be devoted to you, and if you should not be mine, I will have no other bride. With your permission, madam, he added to Mistress Nutter, I will take your daughter to Middleton, where she will find companionship and solace. I trust in the attentions of my sister, who has the strongest affection for her. I could wish nothing better, replied the lady, and now to put an end to this harrowing scene. Farewell, my child. Take her, Richard. Take her, she cried, as she disengaged herself from the relaxing embrace of her daughter. Now, master, no, well, I am ready. It is well, madam, he implied. You will join the other prisoners, and we will set all. At this juncture, a terrible shriek was heard, which drew all eyes towards the beacon. When Mother Demdy had been removed, in accordance with the squire's direction, her conduct became more violent and outrageous than ever, and those who had charge of her had threatened, if she did not desist, carry out the instruction they had received, and cast her into the flame. The whole hag defied them, and incensed them to such a degree by her violence and blasphemies that they carried her to the very edge of the fire. At this moment, the figure of a monk in the mouldering white habiliments came from behind the beacon, and stood beside the whole hag slowly raised his hood and disclosed features that looked like those of the dead. Thy hour is come, a cursed woman, cried the phantom in thrilling accents. Thy term on earth is ended, and thou shalt be delivered to unquenchable fire. The curse of Haslo is filled upon thee, and will be fulfilled upon all thy by Bruce Art thou the abbess shade demanded the hag? I am thy implacable enemy, replied the phantom. Thy judgment and thy punishment are committed to me, to the flames with her. Such was the awe inspired by the monk, and such the authority of his tone and gesture, that the command was unhesitatingly obeyed, and the witch was cast shrieking into the fire. She was instantly swallowed up as in a gulf of flame, which raged and roared, and shot up in a hundred lambent points, as if exulting in its prey. The wretched creature was seen for a moment to rise up in it in extremity of anguish, with arms extended, and uttering a dreadful yell. The flames wreathed around her, and she sank forever. When those who had assisted at this fearful execution, looked around for the mysterious being who had commanded it, they could nowhere behold him. Then was heard a laugh of gratified hate, such a laugh as only a demon or were bound to a demon can utter, and the whole listeners looked around and beheld Mother Chattox standing behind them. My rival is gone, cried the hag, I have seen the last of her, she burnt, aha, her triumph was not allowed her, with one accord, as if prompted by an irresistible impulse, and men rushed on her. 
the seas near the castle to fire. Her wild laughter was heard for a moment above the roaring of the flames, and then ceased altogether. Again the flames shot high in the air, again roared and raged, again broke into a multitude of lambent points, out of which it suddenly expired. All was darkness on the summit of Pendle Hill, and in silence and in gloom. Scarcely more found than that weighing in every breast, the melancholy truth pursued its way to all